Good morning, everyone. That's better. <laughs> I had trouble giving my sermon a title this morning. There are lots of things it could be called. Basic, first of all, I wanted to call it a hell of a message. Or I wanted to call it a message from hell. But ultimately, I've settled for the title, A Cry from Hell, okay? So that, that shouldn't offend the ears of anyone who is here this morning, A Cry from Hell. But it is a hell of a message because that's what it focuses on. So let's take a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, and just a couple of verses. When you've got time, you need to read the whole passage concerning this, but I'm going to break it down, so I'm just uh, having little portions of the word at a time. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there looking for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. So our reading comes from a passage that deals with the subject of both heaven and hell. And Jesus himself gave us this message. So I think it behoves us to look very carefully at what Jesus was trying to impart to the people of the day and what Jesus can impart to us today when we consider this topic about heaven and hell. Now I know it's almost a lost art where hell is ever mentioned in church anymore. You know, somehow that's been pushed right out the back door. But if Jesus taught it, then we ought to look closely at it. Now, what happens when we die? It's something that we think about all the time because we're reminded about death all the time. Look at the, some of the tragedies that have happened in our nation lately. Think of those good people who lost their lives, those volunteers that lost their lives in fighting the fires. Did they wake up that morning expecting that that would be their last day on the face of the earth? No. But it turned out to be it was their last day. Death took hold of them. What about this coronavirus that's running like wildfire all over the place? You know, costing hundreds of lives. When will it end? When will it end? How many lives will it ultimately take? You see, it's all about death. It's all about death. So we need someone who's qualified to explain some of the things to us, and there's no one more qualified than Jesus to do this for us because the Bible tells us that he faced death and he conquered it. One of my favorite verses of Scripture is that it was not possible that death should hold him. Now, there was a moment in time when Jesus died on the cross and I think the devil thought, aha, I've won the victory, he's dead. But it was not possible for death to hold Jesus. So up from the grave he arose. And because he is the one who has faced death, has conquered death, then he's the one that we ought to look to for some explanation of what happens when we die. Because Jesus has pulled back the veil between this world and the next. And behind this veil, we get a glimpse of both heaven and hell. Here's a little illustration for you. Many years ago, there was an epitaph on a tombstone which said, Consider, young man, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. You soon shall be Oh, as I am now, you soon shall be, so prepare, young man, to follow me. That's what was written on the headstone. And it stayed like that for many years. Did my wife put it up there? No, okay. Naughty girl. Okay. <laughs> it was like that for many years until some wise guy decided that he would respond to what was written on the tombstone. And this is what he said. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you were sent. 
But it's so true, you see. When death takes place, there's only two places we can go. It's either to heaven or to hell. Only two places. So let's look what Jesus taught in this passage of Scripture. Let's consider the rich man and Lazarus. For the rich man, what a life he must have lived. It appears that he had money to burn. He's got a lot going for him. He lives in a great house with the finest tapestries on the wall. The very best rugs cover the floor. And the most expensive products from the known world are scattered throughout the house. His money and his credibility demand that. He had the kind of house that people on the street would admire as they walked by and think to themselves, boy, I'd love to live in a house like that. I wouldn't mind having his resources. I'd like to take that person's place for a while. That's just human nature. You see somebody who's doing so well and how uh, they're living so splendidly, and sometimes you just want to take their place for a while. And everybody knew about the fabulous parties they would have. The invited guests would arrive in their chariots, all wanting to make their presence known. So some would come in one horse chariots, maybe two horse chariots, maybe four horse chariots, because they're all wanting to make a statement. They know this rich guy. They're friends with him. They're in league with him. And so they want their fame to be spread about even as the rich man's fame was. But as they rode through the gate to the property, they couldn't help it, but they would see this beggar lying there. But they gave him nothing more than a passing glance. Did they even know his name? No. This was just a piece of garbage that lay at the gate. Maybe some of them wondered if the dogs that were licking his sores would one day maul him to death because even as Lazarus was hungry, so too were the dog hungry. And it would have been a natural occurrence for them to one day take hold of him and try and find a feed that way. But the rich man was too busy living and enjoying the present. He had no thought of eternity. But to his great surprise, eternity was going to catch up with him sooner than he was prepared for. And there was a lesson in that for any of us. We ought to remember that. We sometimes think, okay, I'm only 20 years of age, I'm 40 years of age, I'm 60 years of age. In my case, I'm 76 years of age, whatever it is now. I think, well, I've got a few good years left. Have I? Have we? We don't know. We don't know when eternity will call and when we shall be taken to the world beyond. But here's a rich man that stands for power. He has the ability to do something good, in fact, to do a lot of good. And right there in his front gate is a beggar that stands for need. The beggar is the rich man's opportunity to sow a little something that would count for eternity. But the tragedy of the story that Jesus tells is it appears the two men never come together. Now notice he's not unkind to the beggar. He doesn't have him stoned. He doesn't have him dragged away so he's never seen again. He doesn't have him thrown in prison. His failure was he just leaves him alone in his misery. His failure was he just ignores him. And one day God will hold him to account for that very thing. He just doesn't take any notice of him whatsoever. So this is a story about wasted opportunities that would come back to haunt him one day. And so that day happened. Death came calling. In Luke 16, 22, it says, The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, and he was buried. Now, can you see a difference there? When you're reading the scripture, this is what you've got to look for. You've got to say, what's this telling us? What's the message that this is trying to get across to us? You see, we never get used to death, and yet it's all around us. During my days as a pastor, I used to hear people, older people, saying all the time, 
that getting old was hard because they kept losing their friends and having to go to so many funerals. And now, as I'm at that stage of life, I find it to be so true. I meet with a grump of, <laughs> a bunch of grumpy men, I was going to say, no, I meet with a group of retired pastors and missionaries every Monday morning and we get together. Sometimes there's 10 of us, sometimes there's 16, it just depends. And usually when we talk about what happened in the past week, at least one of us has been to a friend's funeral. We're seeing it all the time. Death is there, we're reminded that death is continually taking place. But here it says both the rich man and Lazarus died. But notice what the Bible says about this. It says the rich man was buried. And what a funeral service that must have been. I can imagine that the rich and famous gathered from all over and they came once again in their chariots dressed in their splendor. And with the different speakers that would have stood before the crowd that day. I can just imagine some of the wonderful stories they told about their rich friend who had now passed on. But he died, and it says he was buried. But the Bible doesn't tell us that Lazarus was buried because in New Testament times, there was a group of people who were hired by the city. And their responsibility was, each night they would patrol the streets and take a two-wheeled wagon with them. And anybody who died, they would simply pick up that dead body and put it on the cart. And then they would take it outside the city of Jerusalem to a place called Gehenna. And there it would be dumped. Dumped into the fire that went day and night, never went out. Because there was always something being thrown into it. It was either dead human bodies or it was dead bodies of animals, or it was the garbage that was collected around the city. It was all tossed into the heap, and it was burning, burning, burning all the time. And the chances are that's what happened to Lazarus. Now, it doesn't tell us that for sure, but it does make the distinction. Jesus makes the distinction that the rich man was buried. And so we assume that this is what happened to Lazarus, because he didn't belong to anybody, wasn't acknowledged by anybody. And so he would have been carted off and to this place called Gehenna. Now Lazarus may not have had a funeral service, but I can imagine that some of his friends, those who were in similar positions that knew him, wondered what would have happened to him. Then finally they realized he's dead, he's gone. And perhaps they said to themselves things like, well, at least it's all over for him. No more suffering now. He's gone. Others might have said, at long last, he's going to find some peace for his troubled soul. His friends may have thought that way. So they're both dead. And now we come to where Jesus gives us a glimpse into heaven and hell. Luke 16, 22 to 24. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in these flames. So right there in that one paragraph, Jesus is giving us a look into heaven. Lazarus is now with Abraham at the banqueting table. Now that, to me that sounds like a good place to be. And the rich man is in Hades or hell and he's in torment. So what a contrast with Lazarus. He's in heaven, and now the rich man, he's in hell. But notice what it says about him. So now Lazarus is being comforted, and you are in anguish. The Bible has so much to say about hell, so I'll cover just the highlights. 
It's a topic that we could go for weeks on because there is so much in the scripture about it. And by the way, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. To warn people, to warn them what lay ahead. So here are some of the highlights about hell. Perhaps we should say lowlights. Because hell is a place of eternal torments. Hell is filled with unimaginable terror. In his parable of the talents, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 30, and cast the unprofitable servant into utter darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So hell is a real place, and one is in constant pain and anguish. In the story of the rich man and the beggar Lazarus, Jesus said to the rich man, or said of the rich man, that he was in torments in Hades, in torments in hell. Notice that Jesus used the plural of the word there, not just torment, but plural, because there are many things that cause the torments in hell. In fact, the torments were so real to him, the pain was so real, that he cries out to Abraham, I am tormented in this flame. So I think to say, I think it's safe to say that hell is one scary place. Hell is a place of unimaginable eternal torments. Secondly, hell is a place of unquenchable fire. Hell will be a place of constant burning throughout all eternity. Speaking of the fiery horror of hell as a comparison only, Jesus said it would be better to go through life maimed than to go into the fires of hell. In Matthew 9 and verse 43, it says, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. Now you can't get any plainer than that. The Greek word for hell that Jesus is using here is Gehenna, which is where we get this idea of continual burning. The valley of Gehenna sat outside the city of Jerusalem and was where all the trash, alongside with the bodies, the dead human bodies and uh, dead animals, and all the rubbish of the city was thrown to be burnt. And to consume it all, the fires would continually burn because each day more and more was added to it. Now Jesus uses this awful scene in describing hell. It's as though Jesus was saying, hey, you want to know what hell is going to be like? Look at the valley of Gehenna. That will give you some idea. So in, a, so in a way, hell may be described as God's garbage dump that is where all those who are unfit for heaven will be thrown into the fires of hell. Yes, with all this fire, what is interesting about hell, and here we have to try and use our spiritual imagination, because what I'm about to say seems to be a contradiction. But it isn't really, if you understand it. Not only does it talk about this fire that's never quenched in hell, but it also talks about hell being a place of the blackest darkness. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 13, and you need to read the whole chapter there to tell us and understand what it's talking about. But it's talking about those whose lives are unruly, are out of order, those lives that have rejected any idea or any thought of God. It says they are like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They're like wandering stars, doomed forever to the blackest darkness. Talking about hell. So imagine that. Not only will a person be feeling the heat and the flames of the fire, but they'll also be living in a darkness that can literally be felt. There's no way to get away from it. No way to shut it off for one moment of time. So Jesus again is speaking of the endless torments that there are in hell. Not just one thing, but many things. And thirdly, hell is a place of eternal separation. Two words there, let's consider them one at a time. First of all, the word, word eternal. This is one of the most terrifying aspects of hell. 
and that is hell is forever. I think some of you, like I, have had a Catholic background. And the Catholics, in their skill in fundraising, came up with the idea that when someone dies, they can go to purgatory for a certain period of time, and if enough prayers are said for them, and if enough uh, gifts are given on their behalf to the church, they can come out of purgatory and finally go to heaven. Now, that's not bad for man's thinking, but it's got nothing to do with the Bible. It's the pure imagination of man. Because once death takes place, there's only two places to go, either to heaven or to hell. And for those who go to heaven, it's forever. And those who go to hell, it's forever. It's forever. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Again, giving a picture of the final destination of all those who are Christ rejectors who have turned their back on the good news of Jesus Christ. The second word that we need to pay attention to is separation. See, hell is a place where people are forever separated from the presence of God. In Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, they will, be sh they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. You see, and if in hell they decide they're going to call out to God, God, help us, God, deliver us, God, save us, God, get us out of here. We're not answering that call because they're shut off. The separation is complete. And so I believe that this may actually be the worst tor torment of them all. Eternal separation from God. Now, I know the media and the, the uh, film industry and other things like that, they make a mockery out of heaven, they make a mockery out of hell. <clears throat> and making a mockery out of hell, one of the things they do, I'd say, well, it can't be that bad, I'll have a lot of mates there. Now, that sounds good. And in human logic, it even sounds reasonable. But let me tell you what's wrong with that statement. Friendship is a gift of God. And there will be no gifts of God in hell. And so no one will have their mates there. There will be lots of others there, but they won't be mates. They won't be friends. They won't be partying and having a good time. There will be an eternal torment. <clears throat> It'll be a place where the person's only companion, now listen to this, it'll be a place where the person's only companion will be the memory, their memory, of them rejecting the call of Jesus Christ in their lives. Fancy having to live throughout all eternity with that hanging over your head. You had a chance to call out and ask for salvation. But you thought you were too smart. I don't need that. I'm doing okay. I'm a tough guy. I'm a tough woman. I don't need that. And now it's too late. And so the memory of that bad decision will haunt you throughout all eternity. So now, having just laid that out, let's come to the message from hell, which is where I've laid all of that as a foundation to be able to come to this part. <clears throat> In Luke 16, reading from verse 27. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, <clears throat> for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. Now Jesus 
made a statement, not particularly uh, enclosed in this section, but it's a general statement, but the truth is applicable. And he said this, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And I'm asking each of us today, do we have ears to hear the cry from hell? Perhaps you've never considered it. That's why God wanted me to share this with you today. Do we have ears to hear the cry from hell? What is the cry from hell? No, it's not what we imagine it to be. Is it, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner? No. Is it people from hell asking God to give them another chance? No. Is it weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, the cry of anguish? No. Is it people cursing God because he has sent them to hell? No, that's not the cry of hell. It's none of those things. It's not even questioning the justice and the fairness of God for sending people to hell. Because those who are in hell are beyond that. They know that they are there because they deserve to be there because of the choices that they have made. And they know that they're there forever. The rich man knew that there was a great gulf fixed. He wanted Abraham to send Lazarus over and give him a little drink of water. He said, can't, it's not going to happen. Nobody from here can go to there. Nobody from there can come to here. It just can't be done. So the rich man knew there was a great gulf fixed. So he wasn't asking to get out anymore. But this was his cry from hell. Send someone to my family. Send Lazarus was what it said. But really he's asking, send someone to my family. Please, Abraham, send someone to my family. Unless, if you don't, they're going to end up in hell with me and I don't want that. Very challenging, isn't it? Send someone. Send someone. So God wants to send someone. Who is God going to send to your family, your friends, your workmates, your neighbors? He wants to send you. He wants to send you. But it's not happening. Why? What's the blockage? And the answer is, and I'm being very blunt here, the answer is, the blockage is, you are. You are. Why? Because you're lacking in love and compassion for the lost. Let me give you just one illustration. You may think, oh, come on, Pastor Michael, that's a bit rough. That's being a bit hard. That's being a bit judgmental. Well, let me give you one little demonstration. Of how, of how ultimately we are the problem. We are. In the last two Sundays, we've heard two great messages on fasting. Pastor Pete broke the ground, and Sister Brenda, wherever you are, you continued on and did a great job last week and expanded it even further about the benefits of fasting in the Christian's life. So now let me ask you, when was the last time that you fasted for one meal, for one day, for one week, or however long you fasted and interceded for your loved ones so they would not go to hell? Think about it. You see, we've got it all up here. We know what we should do, but the doing of it is much more difficult. And it's because we lack love. We lack compassion. Now, I know you would want to challenge me in that, say, but Pastor, I love my family. I don't want to see them go to hell. And I genuinely believe that you're sincere when you say that. So what's the problem? There's no doubt that you love your family members with all your heart. But the problem is it's a natural love. And it's not enough. Why? Because natural love, as we all know, runs hot and cold. It can be boiling one day and can be almost non-existent the next. 
It all depends on how you feel at the moment. And so to love the lost is not a natural thing. It's a God thing. It is a Christ thing. To love the lost, you need to love them with Christ's heart and with Christ's love. What kind of love did Jesus have? He had the kind of love that gave his life for others. There was no price that was too steep for him to pay to demonstrate the love that he had for others. So it means having compassion like Jesus had. The Bible says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he saw them as sheep scattered without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them. He was moved on the inside, moved so much that he wanted to do something for them. Now here's a simple question. Do you have any measure of compassion like that for those who are lost? Do you have any compassion? A compassion that shows itself in travail for the lost. When was the last time you spent any, any period of time, whether it be five minutes, whether it be ten minutes, whether it be an hour, whether you spent four hours of that night, you shut yourself away from the television and from all your distractions, and you've travailed. You've got down on your knees before God, and you said, Lord, I want to see my wife's kids. I want to see them saved. Lord, I bring so-and-so to you. Lord, I plead. You travail for them. Now, I know in devotions you say, well, I pray for my kids every day. Sure, we all do. We pray for our kids. Lord, I pray you'll bless my son today. And keep him safe in all he does. Move on. Lord, bless my daughter also. It's hardly travailing, is it? It's hardly getting in there and being serious about it. But we're presenting it before the Lord, so I don't find any fault in that. But it's something altogether different when it comes to prevailing and having a compassion and a love like Jesus had for lost souls. It's where we begin to agonize over them. Say, Lord, we don't want them. I don't want to see them go to hell. Now, this is not something that you can work up for yourself and you try and get all compassionate for lost people. You can't do it because this is not a natural love. This is a very supernatural love. It's the agape love of God in Christ. It is having the heart of Christ and the compassion of Christ. What will this kind of love and compassion do? It will, transfer, it will transform all our human relationships. It places love on a supernatural plane. It will enable you to love the unlovely. It will enable you to love the unthankful and the ungrateful. It will enable you to love people that you don't like and who even hate the sight of you. It will enable to love, enable you to love people who are indifferent to the claims of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who, when you try and share with them, they laugh at your face and they mock you. But instead of getting angry and turning away and say, Well, you've sealed your own fate. No, the love that is Christ's love, the compassion that is Christ's compassion, will enable you to keep on reaching out anyway, even though they reject you. Because the love of Christ is greater than all these things. So how do I get this love? That's a good question. The answer is the potential for it is already in you. Why? Because Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And when your relationship with Jesus is all that it should be, then his love will become your love. And his compassion will become your compassion. When you're totally surrendered to the Lord, these things will naturally begin to flow through your life. It's called coming back to the earlier statement. 
God wants to send someone to your family, your friends, your workmates, your neighbors. He wants to send you. Are you available? Are you equipped with his love and compassion? Now we know that God's love for the lost is beyond question. It's mentioned so many times in the Bible. Here's a couple of verses of scripture just to encourage you. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. That's the heart of God. God takes no pleasure in sending someone to hell. He wants everyone to come to repentance. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And so I ask you this morning, are you a sent one? The answer is yes. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. That's to all of us. He sends us all to witness about his salvation to others. Now one of the many reasons, and again coming back to this message from hell for a moment, one of the many reasons people give for not witnessing to others is they say, but I don't know what to share with them. I just don't know what to say. Well, this cry from hell gives us a real clue. Look at it in verse, Luke 16, verse 30. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them. Now here it says from the dead. Well, we'll exclude that. But if someone is sent to them, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. And so as God sends us to members of our family and others, our friends, our workmates, our goal should always be to speak to that person in such a way that they become aware of their sinfulness and their need to repent and turn to God. Here is somebody who's already in hell and saying, if they're not going to come here, this is what they need to do. They need to repent of their sin and turn to God. That's got to be the message we preach. We need to tell them, you see, it's okay just to talk about the love of God and all the, the, the soft stuff, as we might call it. But sometimes we've got to speak about the realities. And one of the realities is there's a place called heaven and there's a place called hell. And somebody who's already been sent to hell is crying out and saying, Oh, please, please send someone to my family. I don't want them coming to this place. So God is looking for those that he can send. And as we come to a close, with the muses come on up because I want you to sing that song for us. <clears throat> Got one last verse of scripture that I want to share. And as we share this, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do something about what you've heard this morning. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, this won't come up there because it's something I put on. Isaiah is having a visitation in heaven. God is speaking. And Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. That has to be the response of our hearts. If we're going to 
respond to the cry that comes from the pit of hell and the desire of God and his son Jesus Christ to send someone to our family, to our friends, to our workmates, just to our neighbors, whoever it might be. There has to be this willingness in our hearts. Here am I, Lord. Send me.